Welcome, everyone. This is ForensicWeek.com. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice in downtown College Park, Maryland. Uh, ForensicWeek.com is a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists presented just for you, our visitors that are interested in honest and valuable content of information in the forensic sciences field. Every Thursday evening, 7 to 8, Eastern Standard Time, we are right here at ForensicWeek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows just like this, recorded and broadcast live using Google+, Plus, a social networking service. The format of our show is always flexible, but generally it features a special guest like we have this evening. Uh, we have a segment called Forensic IQ Update Report. That's where one of uh, my University of Maryland student interns uh, who has been doing research all week on various things going on in the forensic community world will highlight those events for you and also direct your attention to the Forensic IQ uh, Inc.com uh, blog where all his abstracts for these special shows, uh, excuse me, special uh, articles are. Some days, uh, some shows will have an open forum show when we will allow our hangout guests just to say their piece. I'd like to introduce the producer of our show, Tim Fromm. Uh, Tim is uh, a student at Maryland. He's one of our interns. And also Mark Lombard. Today's the first show where Mark will be a reporter. He's the forensic I IQ update reporter that you'll be hearing from later, later on. But first, a couple of discussion items. Uh, over the past week, we're all very aware of the shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, in the loss of uh, 20 children's uh, lives and, and six staff. Uh, we've heard the emotion from the families and, and, and uh, the people in that town and, and, and around the country, all over the world. Just for a moment, I'd like to take an unemotional look at the incident. Uh, a lot of people are now looking, at, now looking back, taking a global look, What's the issues? The bottom line is, the, the issue is, what is the cause? What was the cause of this thing that happened? Now, most people want to say, it's guns. If we, and we've got to stop guns. We have to get uh, guns off the streets, and that will take care of the problem. The reality is, the real cause of what happened last week was Adam Lanza in some sort of mental illness that was occurring with him. That is really the cause. Whether he had guns or not, um, the mental illness was there. And he didn't wake up one morning and decide uh, to uh, take his guns and start shooting. This had to be something that was going on for a period of time. So the real issue is, is what can we do about mental illness? What can we do when it's recognized with somebody? If you, uh, for example, if you call the police and say, listen, I think my neighbor is crazy. Uh, he's in the back shooting squirrels in the back, and I heard him talking about how he wants to, uh, he wants to do A, B, and C. Uh, if that person doesn't some, do something overt, the police sometimes, their hands are tied. So we need to reevaluate how do we deal with people when we learn about their behavior as being, you know, questionable. The bottom line is we live in a country um, where we have certain rights. So do we want to give up certain rights for uh, certain protections? So the result of this was death, a feeling of total helplessness by not only uh, the, the children and the people that le were left behind, but across the country to a point where in the last week uh, children all over the country they would go to school and there were police cars and all the street corners and uh, as if that was gonna take care of the problem and it really really doesn't so if we want to spend time my opinion uh, we really need to be looking at um, the, the the real cause and 
how can we help people who have mental illness before they go to the extremes that Adam Lanza did? You know, Adam Lanza is not the first person who's done this. We know, we hear about it all the time in this country, all over the world. And everybody wants to very quickly go to something tangible. Take the guns away is not a problem anymore. I guarantee you that if Adam Lanza didn't have guns in his house, then he would have learned from a, some chemistry uh, set or online, and we're going to be talking about forensic chemistry tonight, but uh, he would learn how to make a homemade bomb, and he would have used a bomb. One other thing about the whole incident, the media. The media's inability to get it right. For some reason, the media believes that we have to, uh, they have to be the first one to report something that's going on. And when it's wrong, they don't care if it's wrong. It's about getting it out as fast as possible. The information they were providing the American people was, was so wrong, you know, to a point where they said the mother was dead in the classroom, that she was a teacher, uh, she wasn't a teacher, she wasn't there. Um, they they literally were naming the uh, Adams brother as the person who was the who was dead in the shooter, uh, and when they make a mistake, they get away with it. Everybody just says, "Oh, it was incorrectly reported." How about why was it incorrectly reported? The people's right to know doesn't necessarily mean they want it now. I'm willing to wait an hour, two hours. I'm with, I'm willing to wait a day to get the right information. So, uh, you know, that makes me feel better. I, you know, the very day of the shooting, I got a call from a reporter down in Virginia about a case. They had 16 fourth-degree sex offense, uh, offenses, all done, they think, by the same person. A, a fourth-degree sex offense, at least in Maryland, is nothing but the intentional uh, touching of a person for sexual gratification. Okay? So she's asking me, first of all, I'm a f forensic science background. She's asking me, why do you think he's doing it? Why are you asking me? I don't know the guy. When you find him, if you want me to talk to him, I'll ask him why he did it. Maybe you can ask him yourself. But they just want to fill up the paper, fill up space. Uh, the uh, television want, wants to fill up um, graphics, and the radio wants to fill up the airways. And I just wish they would just get it right. One other thing, the cold case. As you all know, I talked about the cold case in Jeanette, Pennsylvania that myself and three of my students were working on. You know, it, it, we're down to near the end, and bottom line is what we're finding after talking to all the police departments, the courts, the prosecutor's offices, the, uh, the, the county records management, there is no records that have been held since 1919 that will properly identify what happened. The only records that exist, really, except for the coroner's one-page report that they had a coroner's inquest, are newspaper articles. And I was just criticizing the media, but I got to say, I wish the counties would, would learn from them on how to protect their documents and keep them for long periods of time. So, um, end of that. But we're still working on trying to find anything else on that, but uh, uh, it has been difficult. Now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to you our special guest. He's a forensic chemist. Uh, Dr. Uh, John Tobin goes by Jay, uh, Jay Tobin. Um, Jay, it's a pleasure and honor uh, to have you here. Thank you for coming. Good evening, Tom. Thank you for having me. Uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Tobin. He, um, he's going to talk to us about trace and transfer evidence, because when you talk about forensic chemist, uh, chemistry, it's about trace evidence, transfer evidence, uh, and that's evidence that needs some type of magnification or scientific analysis like his and fibers. Uh, he's going to talk to you in more detail about that, but a little bit of, uh, about him. He's the Associate Professor of Forensic Science and the Program Coordinator of the Masters of Forensic Science Program at Stevenson University in Baltimore County, um, which uh, is a program that is very important for you to know. Those of you listeners who are interested in 
furthering your education in working in a crime lab, you need to understand about the programs. And uh, Dr. Tobin is going to talk to you a little bit about programs in general, but more specifically the program that he comes from, Stevenson University. Uh, Dr. Tobin is retired from the Maryland State Police Crime Lab, where he was director of Forensic Sciences Division and, and chief chemist for, for 36 years. He's a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. In, in fact, that's where uh, uh, Jay and I first met a few years ago. He's a member of the American Association of Crime Laboratory Directors, American Society of Ta Testing Materials, American Chemical uh, Chemical Society. I don't know if he has any time to do any work uh, belonging to all these associations. The American Board of Criminalistics, where he's a fellow, and the Society of Forensic Toxicology. His most recent research which is very interesting and maybe we, hopefully we'll have some time to talk about it, is the identification of biomarkers resulting from exposure to gunshot residue. And uh, gunshot residue uh, is found if and when somebody has fired a weapon. And there's a lot of controversy on what evidence can be exposed or found or identified when a gun goes off. That's... Um, um, Dr. Tobin's area of expertise, at least that's the most recent research he's done, and hopefully we'll have some time to talk about that. So, um, Jay, uh, if I don't, if um, let's kind of start off like I do with all of our guests by talking a little bit about the field of forensic chemistry and what does it encompass? Well, generally, you, you have the textbook definition, which is the application of the physical sciences such as chemistry, biology, to law. But there's another aspect of that. In order to apply something, you need a person to apply it. And that person has to have a certain skill set in order to apply the sciences to law uh, in a good fashion. And that is the ability to think fast on their feet, critical thinking, and the ability to, let's face it, unlock the story that is contained within that evidence. The forensic scientist, therefore, becomes a, a storyteller, if you will, taking what is learned from the bench or from the uh, analytical laboratory and then taking it to the courtroom and explaining it to the trier of fact, which is either the judge or the jury. But okay, they, but, but, but let me interrupt. But you, you just mentioned chemistry and biology. So mm -hmm. forensic chemistry, a person who's a forensic chemist, do they, do they take biology courses or chemistry courses or both? That concept of forensic chemist covers, you know, the borders get blurred after a while. It's a forensic scientist in general. Okay. Where you okay. so, all right, let me ask you a different question again because I'm trying to think for my, my listeners. What kind of evidence is being examined in the laboratory that a person who is, has chemistry, biology background, what kind, of, what kind of evidence are they looking at? Well, there would be two types. There would be the trace evidence, which is like hair, fibers, soil, accelerants, uh, gunshot residue, and then you have the biological trace elements, uh, saliva, semen, blood, uh, things of that nature. Sometimes they are in copious quantities which you have no problem seeing. Other times they are microscopic, but the reason they are there is based upon a solid principle known as low cards exchange theory which simply says whenever two objects come in contact one with the other, there's a mutual exchange of properties. So if I touch you, you get something from me, and I in turn receive something from you. And that is the evidence that the forensic scientist is going to examine, and it's that evidence that contains that factual story. It's just up to the chemist or the scientist to interpret it. When a police investigator who knows many, most of the time knows nothing about what you're doing in the crime laboratory and not, nothing about you know, chemistry or biology, they're at the crime. Now, you can't do anything unless the police bring it to you, okay? Um, when they collect, what kind of evidence are they? Well, you already said it. Here's fibers, biological fluids. When they bring that to you, 
do they ask you to do certain kind of testing or do you tell them what you can do with that evidence? Well, first of all, let's go back to the crime scene. You mentioned investigators. Mm -hmm. Investigators are usually police officers trained to investigate. Now, they may have a smattering of knowledge about the skills in forensic science, but the crime scene technician, who is a an forensic science educated person, is the one under the direction of the investigator who goes through the crime scene with the investigator, they document the scene in sketching, in photographs, uh, in a narrative of what they see, and then they properly collect and preserve that evidence and keep a log of it. It is that evidence then that would come into the laboratory to the forensic scientist. Now, here's where uh, there can be some problems. In order for the forensic scientist to remain completely unbiased, you don't listen to the war stories that the investigators have to say because they are biased. This person did the crime, blah, blah, blah. You don't know that. We want to keep that out of the mix for a while. So the forensic scientist is going to take that evidence, sign the chain of custody, which is a legal parameter. They are going to lock it up until they have a chance to examine it. And when that comes along, they'll open the package and they'll begin to sort through and determine what type of examinations they're going to perform. How much information are you looking for from either the investigator or the evidence technicians to help give you some direction in what you, how you may approach the examination of the evidence? Most of the examiners on routine cases don't even come in contact with an investigator unless it's for a rush case. On CSI, that happens all the time. What do you mean? They're not there next to you wearing a white coat? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nor do I go out to the crime scene and pick the evidence up and run back and get it all done between 9 and 5. Uh, the investigators, if it's a a big case, a homicide, a rape case, something that, uh, like the thing in Connecticut, that reaches out to the public, that demands more attention for obvious reasons. But the majority of the cases, the scientist would take the evidence, open it up, read what it says on the submission sheets, how they got the evidence, what it is, and then begin uh, to perform the analysis on the uh, the evidence itself. The test that they do, by the way, uh, in, in my laboratory, the Maryland State Police, an accredited laboratory, everything that you do is by an SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. And that purpose for that is to add copious quantities of quality control and quality assurance into the analysis so that everybody is on the same page doing the same thing. And if a mistake occurs, you can find where it is by going through that, that protocol. What's a typical day for a person who, is, who identifies himself as a forensic chemist or forensic toxicologist? Or, how do they refer to them? Is it, are they called forensic chemists in the laboratory that, that doing the types of work that you're talking about? Well, uh, back in my director's days, we had forensic chemists, we had latent print examiners, firearm examiners, we had a Noah's Ark of job descriptions. Uh, and with that came different pay scales. So. I felt that since we're all doing the same job, we're all generally forensic scientists, we should be classified accordingly and paid accordingly. <laughs> so we had the forensic scientist series uh, established, which was one, two, three, uh, and supervisor grade, and then lead scientist was put in there to give people a career ladder. And of course, the different levels meant more different or different salaries and more seniority. But 
the general term that we like to use is a forensic scientist with a specialty in a particular forensic discipline like drug chemistry, trace evidence, uh, DNA, firearms. When I so students who are in grad school, because a, a lot of the folks now that are getting hired in crime labs have a have an advanced degree, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about Stevenson. Mm -hmm. um, do they specialize in a particular area in grad school to try to get themselves uh, in a position to be hired uh, in, uh, by a certain um, department or, or laboratory? It depends upon the program that you go into and that's why I would tell a student who's interested in forensic science to research the schools that are out there to see what they have to offer that is attractive to the student. Okay, a lot we'll, of these we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. I don't want, I, I, I want to, let's, um, because that's important. That's an important message. Uh, I'm trying to get a picture of you or someone like you in the, in the laboratory. What's a typical day for someone like you? And I know there's no such thing as a typical day in our business, but uh, what kinds of things are they doing? Well, you would come in and you go to your lab in your particular discipline. You're never going to run out of work because every crime laboratory in this country has got a backlog. So you're not going to find anybody just sitting there waiting for a case to come in the door. You're either going to pick up the case that you left yesterday or begin a new one. Uh, you will sit there and go through this case uh, according to the SOP. You may have to take a break to go to court to testify. You may get several phone calls of uh, state's attorneys asking you questions uh, about the facts in the case or an investigator's wanting to know where it comes up. Now, here's where the personality of the person doing the work is extremely important. You can get bored at doing your work. I tell my students, if you're bored in a forensic job, that's your fault. It's not the manager of the laboratory, not the supervisor. It's yours. You need to do something to stimulate yourself to make this job interesting. When I did the trace evidence, I was always looking, what else can be done here to unlock this story? And you know, it, it kept my mind challenged uh, and everything. And because of it, I got a patent from the U.S. government. Huh. Fifteen well, minutes sitting on the toilet in the bathroom gave me the idea, but <laughs> it was patentable. Okay. All right. Well, all right. So we all, well, whatever job we have, we always want to feel that we're that we make a difference somewhere. Give me, give me some, uh, give me some, some things in your thirty uh, uh, six years at MSP, let's say, where you were investigating, you were examining evidence that you really think it made a difference in a case. I'll give you a case that's real recent that I did not do, but my wife was involved in it. She is the uh, deputy state's attorney in Harford County. You're married to a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> I <Very> know. Good. <laughs> right. But she was prosecuting a child abuse case, and that's where she worked for the uh, uh, child advocacy. I can't say that word. Uh, center. But this uh, suspect had sexual relationships with a seven-year-old girl. Uh, with. Uh, the mother allowed him to do it because she was the boyfriend, or he was the boyfriend. He was and the mother's boyfriend. He was the mother's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And what finally led to his conviction was the forensic evidence on the little girl's bed, on her sheets, uh, etc., and swabbings that matched his DNA. So when you get a case like that, and it does it serves justice that makes you feel good being a forensic scientist it's that giving back to the community 
but not everybody is really altruistic about that and goes into work every day about the community. Right. Most people go in there about a paycheck. And when that happens, again, that possibility of a mistake while working a case can can come up. That's why uh, as a director, we try to make sure that everybody got training, like going to the American Academy meetings, uh, taking online courses, giving them things that would stimulate their growth in their career so that it would not become stagnant. And again, that was the forensic science series to let them climb up the ladder. What percentage of evidence does a scientist in a laboratory examine that never even reach? If you're in trace evidence, we'll sit down on big cases and go down the litany of evidence that is there and prioritize it. What's the most important evidence in this case that needs to be analyzed? So we'll look at that first. What are the secondary items that can wait in case the primary um, evidence is thrown out of court that we would come back and analyze. And then there's probably evidence that we have, but it's not deemed that important uh, as of yet in this case. If you do everything that is submitted, you're never going to get the case ready for court in time. You have 180 days to get this case out the door from once it comes in out the door uh, for trial or it can be thrown out um, without you doing anything to it and we right. want to prevent that I got a situation I right. um, crime scene is processed evidence collected it goes to the lab um, the investigators identify a suspect they're trying to create probable cause to make an arrest they don't have enough for probable cause so they're looking for some as some of the pieces of evidence they may know about or not uh, might need to be processed uh, to establish that probable cause. Mm -hmm. How does that communication occur between the investigator and the laboratory? Well, what we had uh, at the MSP was case coordinators who would sort of be the go-between between the forensic scientists and the investigators. Again, we wanted to keep this biasness away from those who are actually going to do the case. For example, imagine the scientists that are going to work on uh, the Connecticut case, if this person was still alive, the, the uh, suspect, mm -hmm. and you already know about it. That's playing on your mind, your humanity, your parenting uh, of these children being killed that's going to affect your judgment in doing casework. We don't want that to happen. So we have, on the bigger cases, case coordinators who listen to all of this and then they decide where the evidence uh, more or less is going to go and what will be prioritized. Now, in this case here, you want something to show the relationship between the suspect and the crime scene. It's got to be something that is identifying fingerprints DNA. Uh, it's not something that can be uh, a general classification, like a hair. Oh, this matches the same color hair. Well, so too does 50 billion other uh, types of hair. You, you bring up something, and Mark, I want you to be prepared uh, to discuss the one with the 1970s uh, piece of evidence that was identified. But before, uh, Mark and Tim, be ready to, uh, to present that. Um, hair uh, and, and what it can tell us uh, <laughs> um, prior to DNA and, and post DNA. What information can we get from a hair today? Today, whether it's animal or human, and then they'll take it and uh, look for the follicular tag to determine if it's DNA. No longer are comparisons done to see if it's going to be a match with a known versus unknown because it's one of those areas that was strictly subjective uh, you know up to the uh, expertise of the examiner. Far too many mistakes were being made 
because of rash judgment uh, and stuff. So now, because of DNA and, and the ability to get DNA from a follicular tag on a hair, that's where it goes. But we can distinguish animal from human with very little problem. Okay, I'm going to have Mark tell you um, one of his stories that he was going to present. I want him to talk about it now so you can comment on it. Uh, now, for the listening audience, uh, we didn't share this with uh, Dr. Tobin uh, because I didn't think it would be relevant, but it is very relevant now. So, uh, Mark, tell us a little about, about that story that, uh, that we put on the blog uh, this week. All right, so in the, in the trial, um, it talks about in 1978, this man named Sante Tribble was convicted for the murder of a southeast Washington taxi driver after an FBI examiner claimed that he microscopically matched Tribble's hair to one in a stocking found at the crime scene, which was believed to be the killer's, worn by the killer during the, during the murder. And... Um, uh, interesting thing is that in 1978 they didn't even have the technical capability to positively identify an individual from a single hair. They, but, uh, but it said that the FBI testified that they said that that hair belonged to the defendant to the exclusion of all others? Yes, an FBI examiner claimed that it was microscopically matched. Okay, uh, and we're going to find out from Jay in a moment what that means. Uh, meanwhile, so what happened since then? Um, so he 20, was how many years later? 30 years later, after he was exonerated after new DNA testing proved that none of the hairs used as evidence in the, in the original trial in 1978 matched Tribble's genetic profile. And uh, so, and they let him fr they, uh, they let him free after 30 years. Yes. So he, he spent 30 years in prison because of a hair that ultimately science said wasn't. A match. Well, matched. Okay. All right, Jay, comment. First of all, was the examiner's initials MM in that case that you <laughs> the mentioned? Name of, is the name of the exa uh, examiner in there? We'll use initials. I don't think his, his initials were in the original article. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, because the FBI did have a problem with the hair examiner that was making rather rash opinions on hair analysis to the exclusion of all others. Mm -hmm. uh, in my dealings with hairs, that's not possible. You can say they are characteristic or similar, but to the exclusion of all others would be to put hair analysis in the realm of fingerprint and DNA and uh, dental work. You know, bite marks because of the 168 surfaces in your mouth. And that's just not possible. It is strictly uh, subjective. Isn't it true that back then, because uh, lawyers, judges, uh, really didn't understand science, they would literally, whatever a scientist said, as long as his or her credibility as a scientist was there, they would believe anything they said. They didn't question it. That's true. You know, when um, I get hired, when I get hired by a um, uh, a defense attorney to look at a, you know one of their clients' case, I look at it and uh, and I start reading the you know the lab reports, and I'm say okay, I see what the lab report says, but what it means is something different, and that's where they need to understand. I'll give you a perfect example. I testified in a trial up in Hagerstown one day. And uh, it was a drug case. After the case was over, the juror says, we knew that he was guilty from what you said because science, you're a scientist and science is always correct. And I happen to say, oh, I read this uh, newspaper this morning and Apollo 13 seems to be having a little problem from the science that went into it. <laughs> and uh, she's, they are, but science is not infallible. Uh, you know, we try to unlock that story. But well, I think Congress recognizes that after the Mayfield case. And <laughs> for the listeners who are not familiar with the Mayfield case, when we when we talk about fingerprints, maybe sometime uh, in the next uh, month or so. 
uh, Mayfield is a case where the FBI, um, in fact, three FBI experts with 20 plus years of experience examining fingerprints, made a mistake. Made a mistake on their on their analysis. And when that occurred, because there was a, there was so much publicity on that, all of a sudden Congress said, "Hey, we need to look at this whole." industry of, of forensic science and crime labs and what they're saying and, and now they're putting a they're they're putting more responsibility on judges to be the um, the um, gatekeeper, gatekeeper if you may of um, to ensure that what is being presented is valid and reliable and and should be presented in a court of law for them to to, to hear and appreciate right well Maryland is a fry uh, state going by it's got to be good science I'm more of a Dalbert fan because it's got five criteria in there that uh, the evidence has to meet one of which is peer review another one is which you've got to state your uh, relative degree of uncertainty and now there are sciences uh, again in the NAS report of 2009 states that there are certain forensic disciplines that can't really give you a measurement of uncertainty uh, like firearms analysis, latent prints, question documents, all the pattern analysis stuff. So there is a big push nowadays to add an element of probability or if you will uncertainty to those type of analyses to give mm -hmm. the jury a better understanding rather than words such as to the exclusion of all others correct you know I, well I mean DNA is the one is the best when when, when DNA is presented it tells you uh, uh, you know this is a match and the odds of it not being a match are one to ten you know ten you million know, or a hundred thousand and it gives you a sense where do those odds come from? If you look at the profiles, PowerPlex or, or whatever they're using now, they use 13 loci. Each one of those loci taken individually may have a probability of 1 in 100, which isn't really big. Mm -hmm. But because they occur independent of each other, the entire probability can be uh, determined by what's called the chain rule. One out of a hundred times one out of a hundred times one out do that thirteen times and you come up with these probabilities of one in trillions which you know exceeds the uh, population of the earth so that is why it is so identifying it has a mathematical basis which people can whether they understand math or not at least there's a number there defining it it's not my opinion to the exclusion of all others because I'm matching things and it's you know it's my opinion okay uh, I'm watching the time and and uh, I want to make sure that we spend some time specifically talking about graduate programs because this is a this is a question that I've been getting from undergraduates for years you know and you know, what should I do where should I go now that high schools are teaching forensic courses they're starting to ask these questions earlier so tell us about graduate programs in forensic science and then again you're from Stevenson University a fine university that I have visited a number of times and I'm very impressed and so tell us a little bit about uh, for, uh, uh, Stevenson specifically okay um, Stevenson is a, uh, a small liberal arts college in Baltimore County we have approximately uh, in my program, 33 students now. We started out with four in 2005 and now have grown to that. We have, uh, to date, 59 graduates. 32 of them are employed in uh, forensic laboratories to include uh, six of the major counties uh, in um, Maryland, Baltimore City, MSP, the Medical examiner. MSP office. is Maryland State Maryland Police. State Police. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OCME, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, uh, Prince George's County, uh, the Federal Lab, FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, United States Secret Service, uh, Armed Forces Institute of uh, DNA Analysis, and the uh, Bureau of Printing and Engraving. 
Uh, we have also four students who have gone on to uh, seek their PhD from this program. Uh, there are a lot of pro forensic programs. I mean, they've sprung up like mushrooms because of the CSI effect. Uh, the CSI effect, I'm sure everybody is aware of, it's because of the shows that depict forensic science on TV. There are over 42 shows. My favorite is uh, NCIS because they have Abby. Abby is an expert in every discipline. <laughs> every discipline out there from DNA to firearms to drug testing to trace evidence and gets it all done, not one case, but two or three cases inside of their given hour to include commercials. And she's always right. And she's and got some nice tattoos, <laughs> which must make court look good. But the first thing we do when they get in our program is we debunk that idea. Why do you want to be a forensic scientist? And they go through all of these, these things. And then I tell them one of the first programs that they go through at Stevenson is a rotation. And our rotation is different than others. It's not an internship. Internships are when students go into labs to be helpers. And most interns are given mundane tasks to do that the analysts really don't want to do. But in ours, those students are in there to observe what's going on. I give them questions. I want you to watch their stress level. I want you to uh, watch the interaction of the scientists with their working group. Do they get along? Is there, uh, you know, bickering, fighting? Some. How's management going? They also take the quality assurance, quality control course at the same time, and I'm asking them to give me examples of what they see that's good QA, QC, and tell me examples that they see is not. They are all ISO 17025, which is the accreditation uh, source that the crime laboratories come under. So we are actually putting this education to work while they are in the labs, and the reason it's there is because they got to make up their mind, is this the career that I want to spend $35,000 or so in trying to get, and then can I get a job when I get out of here? There are so many places and only so many jobs. One of the things that Stevenson has is a good networking program. The reason this program is here is because back in 2003 at the Maryland State Police Crime Lab, we were losing scientists. And we had to bring them in to train them anyhow, so we decided to formulate a program that would actually train college chemistry majors, biology majors, and entice them to becoming forensic scientists. In other words, it was our minor league that they could come in and, and work in the laboratory, hit the road running. We wouldn't have to uh, train them as much, but now with all the accreditation protocol, you got to train them from square one anyhow. So yeah. when 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 Maryland State Police came up with this thought, did they establish a relationship with Stevenson? Yeah, that that was through me. Uh, okay, I, and then then when you re retired, you just moved over to Stevenson. I did. That's good. That's good. Okay. Now, how about? The criminal justice major, who's a non-science major, mm -hmm. who is interested in forensics, maybe to be an evidence technician, or maybe to be a better investigator. Because I know I went through my forensic program not because I wanted to be a scientist working in a laboratory. I wanted, I wanted to understand as much about science as possible to help me uh, to recognize evidence and to know what information I could get from it. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Uh, now, because of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, people like me can't take certain, can't get into certain programs unless I have X amount of credits of science. So, talk to us about the difference between the forensic science program and the forensic studies program. Okay, as I said, the forensic science program is for scientists who want to work on the evidence in an analytical concept. The forensic studies program. 
of which one of those tracks is the criminalistics track, teaches you forensic science and investigation at the same time. Uh, one of the courses in there is uh, interrogations, investigations, and stuff, so you learn to be an investigator. But in the criminalistics track, you take courses similar to those being taught in the forensic science, but they're not laboratory-based. You get all of the scientific concepts, uh, such as fingerprinting, question documents, things that you can use as a forensic investigator. That education is good enough for you to be hired as a crime scene investigator for a police department. And the reason I know this is because there's three people who have graduated from that program who work as crime scene technicians. But you wouldn't get a job working in the laboratory as the scientist portion. It's not that deep in science. We only require for that program that you have 12 credits in science be it in college, whatever, just so that you can understand science ease when we're talking about it that's in there. Okay. Uh, what can uh, any listeners out there do to learn more about Stevenson's program? And, uh, um, and when should they start? If you're in high school, okay, uh, and, and I've asked this uh, to uh, um, to our other uh, our guests in the last couple of weeks. If you're in high school and you really believe you want to be a forensic scientist, um, and if you're lucky, I was lucky, I know I wanted to be, go into law enforcement investigations when I was in high school and they never changed. W what should they do in reference to, may, uh, what, what should they do in their undergraduate program and then, and then to prepare for their graduate program? Okay, that's a real good question. Uh, first of all, there's uh, a plethora of programs out there with the word forensic in them. You can start out with a basic bachelor's degree in forensic science. Uh, I personally am not a fan of that because uh, as a laboratory director, I did not have a lot of uh, people who had the scientific background coming from that program. They knew about the concepts of forensic science, but they didn't have the science concepts to work on the bench. It was easier to hire a chemist major, a biology major, and teach them the forensic science than vice versa. Uh, with that in mind, students who come and are looking for a job with a BS degree, mm -hmm. uh, their chances are slim and none. Why? Be again, because there's a lot of programs such as Stevenson that are out there giving master's degrees. Just before I left MSP, we had a position open for a DNA analyst. I had eight or nine BS degrees. I had 150 master's degrees. I'm not even going to look in the BS pile. I'm going to sort through the master's degree. Why? At uh, MSP, we gave the master's degree one year's worth of experience. In the, the forensic science series I told you about, mm -hmm. somebody coming in with zero practical work was given one year of experience because of the work that they did in their master's program. If they happen to have part of that master's program, as Stevenson does, with a mock trial experience, they were given credit for that. So it was kind of, kind of liberal. And that would bring you in as a forensic scientist, too. So that education in the master's degree brought you up one whole level that if you were to work that, would probably take you two additional years because you wouldn't get to testify for two years. Uh, let me stop you there. So I, I think the main message is for those who truly want to work in a crime lab, they, they have to be thinking postgraduate work uh, to really be uh, valuable enough uh, to, to get a job in a crime laboratory today. And, That's correct. And I would say before the CSI effect uh, really hit, um, the bachelor's degree 
was probably enough for a while there. But yeah. uh, it, it, because but the, those programs, the, the positive effect of the CSI effect was all these wonderful programs that have actually been created. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. 42 plus. Right. Well, let me ha have you stand by for a moment because uh, I'm looking at the time and we, we want to we keep with our hour. I'm going to ask uh, Mark to uh, jump in here and give us a forensic IQ uh, uh, blotter story. All right, so we have one more. Um, going off of the, the CSI effect, uh, in one of the articles that we have for this week, uh, it talks about a new 3D crime scene reconstruction tool uh, that a Berks County detective, Albert Shade, discovered by using a free downloadable computer program to create 3D models of crime scenes based off of measurements and drawings from evidence technicians of the crime scene. And with the new software, with a few modifications of the gaming software that is included, uh, Shade was able to virtually take the viewer through the crime scene, actually, and change the angles and zoom in on certain pieces of evidence, which can later be used in during trial to show juries basically like the whole story of the crime scene and, and the events that took place. Now, was it was this was he allowed to testify to this evidence? Um, it was actually been used okay. uh, in two homicide cases already to reconstruct two homicide cases, and in two other cases it was used to resolve the case, which resulted in two guilty pleas. Okay, good. Well, and let me just tell our listening audience that um, Forensic IQ. Uh, is partners with a, a company, the only company in, in Maryland that uses uh, 360 3D uh, uh, laser technology. And uh, uh, I worked a, a homicide arson case uh, for, for the defense where we utilize that uh, technology to be able to show that a, an alleged suspect leaving the scene of the crime via a surveillance photograph was in fact not our client that that that, that the prosecution alleged, uh, because thank God our client was six foot four inches high. In using that technology, they were uh, they were able to look at the photograph of this person that they believed was our client, and they were able to determine that he was five foot five inches high. And so, because of the significant difference. That became became major evidence, and our client was found not guilty even without this evidence. But we were prepared to use that. Very good. Okay, Mark. In the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you right there. Right. Um, let me uh, just uh, talk to the folks a little bit about uh, the next couple of weeks. Uh, next Thursday, two days after Christmas, we've decided uh, that we won't do a. Uh, ForensicWeek.com show, so don't be looking for us live next Thursday, but the following week, which is January 3rd, we certainly will be back live, and uh, we will have as a special guest uh, uh, Paul Woody, who's a computer forensics expert. He's the CEO of Woody Cyber Security Associates. Uh, um, Paul and I have worked together uh, over the years, uh, both as Department of Defense uh, employees. Uh, he is a partner of Forensic IQ, um, retired, as I said, from the Department of, uh, of Defense uh, as a curriculum manager for the uh, uh, Defense Security Service Academy. Um, he was teaching training courses in identity theft, uh, viruses, uh, malware, uh, and cyber intrusions into uh, critical infrastructures, power grids, etc. Paul is going to talk to you about the importance of evidence that are find, found in computers. And for example, right now, even though the suspect uh, in the in the Connecticut case uh, killed himself, they are now evaluating the whole case and why did he do what he he did. And one way to learn about the way a person's mindset is at any given time is to examine his computer. Now, I understand from Paul today that the uh, suspect was able to do something to to destroy aspects of his hard drive, like he anticipated uh, that the police would be looking. 
And so Paul's going to talk a little bit about, okay, just because a hard drive looks like it has been uh, destroyed or altered, does that mean the information is gone? So a lot of interesting things to talk about in computer forensics, uh, and we're lucky enough uh, to have uh, Paul with us uh, on January 3rd. Uh, and uh, after he talks about computer forensics in, in, in general terms, uh, in a couple of months we'll have some computer forensic, forensic investigators who are police officers who are now working in these special fields. Most large police departments have computer forensic units that focus on that. There isn't a crime scene today that doesn't have automation, computer systems, or something with social networking and everything else. People, uh, you know, their mindset, what they do, their planning process when considering committing uh, crimes or uh, future activities, the computer, it always focuses around their computer, their, their, um, their telephone, their iPad, something. And it's the job of the computer scientist uh, the computer forensics expert who uh, uncovers this information. Now, many investigators out there do not have the uh, uh, knowledge or skills to really understand that. So it's important that they understand the capabilities of these people. Again, if you when you go out and get a license to drive a car, you don't have to be uh, a certified a mechanic. You know, you need to understand the vehicle, how to use it properly, how to keep it safe, uh, and to know when you need the mechanic. And that's what we're talking about. As investigators, you need to know when you need the forensic scientists and how they can help you. And that's what ForensicWeek.com is all about, bringing in people like our, our fine guest today, Dr. Tobin, to give us an appreciation for what they do in the... Uh, Jay, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day. I know this is the end of the semester. Does, does uh, Stevenson graduate? Did they did graduation occur yet? Graduated Monday. We graduated today. In fact, uh, that's good. So we got a few weeks off before uh, uh, semester starts again. I want to thank you very much, uh, Jay, for being with us. And uh, my pleasure. I, I hope that uh, you can find some time in the near future to talk with uh, us about some other areas. I know we wanted to talk about gunshot residue, and the subject is too important to just rush through it. Mm -hmm. So I really would like to um, maybe spend a whole show. Uh, I know you had a lot of good slides, etc., uh, because that's one of the biggest misnomers that we see on television. People assume that if you shot a gun, that they're going to be able to... Uh, be able to identify that, and uh, um, and because that's what that's how they do it on television. So, because you truly are the expert in that area, um, um, we really want to hear um, what we need to know and understand about that, and what is currently being done. So, hopefully, you can come back to do that. Be happy to. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. Um, to Tim from Tim. Tim's the man behind the scene that makes sure that our guests are ready and are here for you, that we're on time. Uh, Tim, great job. Um, Tim just uh, took my final this past week, uh, and so did Mark, and they both obviously passed uh, and did fine. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on the show tonight. Um, good job, both of you. Uh, thank you, Tim, for uh, your continued uh, uh, hard work. Uh, Mark, Thank you for being prepared. Uh, I know Dave Miller uh, graduated today. Uh, uh, the last couple of uh, shows, Dave was the uh, Forensic IQ Update reporter, and as I mentioned, uh, Mark was taken over. And he, I, I think, Mark, I think uh, you learned you were taken over just uh, Monday evening. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sure. Again, you don't want to know too much ahead of time. You, <laughs> you, you, you just get nervous. You get nervous, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are out there listening, thank you. But I need your help. I need you to tell other people about this show. Get them to listen. The more successful this show is, the more we're going to be able to bring great people like we did today. ForensicWeek.com is being brought to you through the cooperation of the uh, Hangout10.com live TV show network. Please stay tuned each week. As I said, tell your friends and colleagues to watch um, either live or remember, all our shows are archived on ForensicWeek.com. They can go anytime. 
those of you who are teachers, you can actually have your students um, be required to see certain shows depending on uh, your curriculum and what the area is for them. Uh, all they have to do is go to ForensicWeek.com webpage, and it's there. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you have a wonderful, wonderful, healthy, um, and uh, happy and safe uh, 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 holiday. Uh, good evening, and we'll see you on January 3rd. Thank you.